the economist Arthur Lewis published a book about the world economic order in the 19th century, and he pointed out that in the 19th century, about 100 million people moved from one place to another. Half of those people were what we call whites or Europeans who moved from Europe to North America, to Brazil, to Argentina, to South Africa, and to Australia. The other half were what we call, not a good term, non-whites, Africans, Asians, others, who moved to Pacific Islands, to the Caribbean, to Cuba, and within Asia. The whites moved to temperate climates and to economically developing areas. The non-whites basically moved into plantation areas. Um, and so what is the point here? The 19th century is sometimes called an age of emancipation, and it's easy to see that. Slavery is abolished in many places, not only the United States. Serfdom is abolished in Russia. Coerced labor, see, it seems, is being abolished in the 19th century. Um, and this is progress, obviously. But there's another kind of emancipation, one might say, which is people moving from some kind of economic autonomy into a kind of coerced labor. Many of the people who now, after emancipation, in the uh, Caribbean, let's say, will be working on plantations, are not slaves, but they're working as indentured labor, long-term contracts. They have fallen into economically, not risen. In the United States, slaves move up into a condition of free labor, perhaps. In the Decades after the Civil War, many, many white farmers who own their own land lose their land and fall into a kind of indebtedness, um, tenancy. So in other words, freedom is not a one-way street. Many people are gaining freedom. Many people are losing freedom economically in the course of the 19th century. And I just mentioned this to begin with because this question of what is freedom, what, 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 what is going to replace slavery, is fundamental to understanding the Reconstruction period and afterwards. What is the definition of freedom, actually? The, the very notion of freedom becomes a point of conflict, a point of struggle in this period. And of course, the definition of freedom depends to a considerable extent in the United States on your definition of slavery. What is it that was abolished? Was it coerced labor? Was it racial inequality? Was it a whole political and social system based on slavery? Is freedom an individual or a kind of group entitlement? What inequalities are essential to slavery and what are peripheral to it, and therefore might continue even though slavery is abolished? Does allowing people to sell their labor in a marketplace make them free? Is that what free labor means? Or are there other things that come along with it? And many, many issues revolve, uh, or revolve around those questions. What is freedom? Who is entitled to freedom? And what are the social conditions that make freedom possible? Those are not exactly the same questions, but all of them are debated. In the Janap book, we have some readings this week of former slaves remembering the moment of emancipation. But emancipation does not tell you what comes next after slavery. Now, I want to actually point to this famous painting by Winslow Homer called A Visit from the Old Mistress. It's 10 years after the end of the Civil War, and he's just now, this is a scene where the old mistress, the woman from the plantation house, is visiting several slaves, presumably in the slave quarters. What is Winslow Homer telling us in this painting? What, what, what kind of, what, what, is, what is going on here? What kind of atmosphere is he trying to project in this painting, the visit from the old mistress? How might this encounter differ from a similar visit before the Civil War. Homer is trying to tell us something about freedom here. Is there some defiance there? Yes. The, what is the atmosphere? It is tension. There is a, it, there's nothing violent. There's, it's not an altercation. 
there's a tension, there's a space. He puts a space between the white woman and the first black woman. And the former slaves are not bowing, scraping. They are standing there with the same dignity as the white woman. And this is, it's not an encounter of equals because look at the dress. Obviously the woman is much better off economically, but it is not an encounter of master and slave either. It's an ambiguous kind of encounter with an air of tension around it. And the slaves are standing on an equal level in some personal way to the old owner. They're asserting their dignity in the face of the person. Before the war, that, you would not adopt that stance if you were a slave encountering your owner. So this is just, I mean, this is just one little illustration of how freedom brings with it all sorts of tensions and questions and um, uncertainties um, 10 years after the Civil War. It's a very remarkable painting. Anyway, to grossly oversimplify, I, I think there was a kind of triangular debate going on in the aftermath of the Civil War about this question of freedom. Triangular among the former slaves, white Southerners, particularly the ex-planters, and the victorious North about what freedom was, what were the consequences, what were the consequences of emancipation, what should follow. And this, this issue involves, and we will talk about it over the next few weeks, many, many aspects of life. But what I want to focus on today is the sort of interrelated questions of labor and land. And because most contemporaries recognize that this was the crux of the whole problem. What labor system is going to replace the labor system of slavery? As William H. Trescott, a very prominent South Carolina planter wrote in 1865, you will find that this question of control of labor underlies every other question of state interest. There's a lot of issues, but this question of c control of labor is pivotal in figuring out what's going to happen in Reconstruction.